<laughs> Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we are so grateful to gather together in your name. We thank you for Carmela and Jan. God, uh, thanks for their gift. And God, I pray that you would just bless them for blessing your bride here at Living Water. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me to each and every one of us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we've made it back to Luke chapter 11 and verse 27 through 32. That's what we're going to be covering today. And last week, what did we cover? Who remembers? I'm jogging your memory. 11, 24, and 26 through 26. And in those verses, remember there was a demon possessed guy, right? And Christ cast the demon out of him. Uh, it, it was a story, but the man didn't receive the Holy Spirit. And so that demon went through waterless places, came back. Check oh, Mike went out. Oh, yeah. So we've got a short in this. Oh, no. We got to buy a new cord. Oh, yeah. Okay. You can hear me now, right? Yeah. If you, I know you can, but they can't. <laughs> Those people. Oh, I mean those people. <laughs> yes. So anyway, this demon got seven more demons, more evil than him, came back and repossessed the guy, right? And we figured out that God has created a void in all of us. Everyone born on planet Earth has a spiritual void. A lot of theologians say they are spiritually what? dead, right? And, and so uh, that void, I, I can assure you, even in cultures where they never hear about God, the gospel, or anything else, the Holy Spirit works on those people. Do you know that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have had people at Calvary Chapel Bible College when I was teaching that came from other countries that never had a missionary. In a dream, they got the gospel. Isn't that amazing? So God can work on everybody. There's a spiritual void. In fact, the Bible says if you seek God, what? You will find him. If you seek him, you find him. So in every culture, in every religion, the people that are truly seeking the one true God, that spiritual void, they're going to find him. But they need to hear as well, right? So today, Jesus will clarify who his mother, brothers, and sisters are in our text today. <laughs> so if you have your Bibles, hold on. If you have, oh my goodness gracious. I might switch to your mic. If you have your Bibles, can you hear me? Okay, turn to Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 27. And while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. It's kind of interesting. Blessed here simply means blessed. That's all it means. It really comes from the root word charis, which is what? Grace. Yeah, so grace to you. Grace means uh, unmerited favor. You are blessed. May blessings and peace come to you. Luke 142 says this. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Who said that? Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah. Same word here, blessed. It's the same exact word for all of us, Galatians 3, 9. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. We're all blessed, right? Okay. So, Mary is indeed blessed, Luke 1, Mary said, and this is usually called what? The, it starts with an M. Magnificat. The Magnificat of Mary. And Mary said, my soul exalts in the Lord, and my spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has had regard for his humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me 
blessed. Okay, folks, the Catholic Church takes those two verses and they try to make Mary a co-redemptress. Have you ever heard that term? Okay, in fact, even on uh, many of their churches, they will have Jesus hanging on the front of the cross and Mary hanging behind him on the back of the cross. Have you ever seen that? All right, so count me blessed is just simply she's blessed like every believer. She's not to be exalted. James 5.11, we count those blessed who endured. Same word, exactly. So how does Jesus clarify it all for us? The next verse in our text this morning, Luke uh, chapter 11, verse 27. And while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nurse you. But he said, On the contrary, blessed are those who do what? Hear the word of God and observe it or keep it. We could say, obey it. All of us are blessed. Jesus said that it's not uh, just Mary who is blessed, but everybody who hears the word of God and obeys it, including Mary. And Jesus said this to warn about exalting Mary because he knew prophetically that the Catholic Church would one day worship Mary. And they do. And this isn't the only time he said it, Luke chapter 8, verse 19. And his mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Okay, even Jesus didn't give Mary any... Uh, veneration didn't exalt her beyond just being a woman of God who loves God and loved Jesus, obviously. Mark puts it like this, Mark 3.33. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That includes all of us. Matthew puts it like this, Matthew 12, 48. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. And he said that in Mary's hearing. Even though they were outside, they could hear. I think what Jesus was trying to clarify is that everybody who is born again is important. All of us. Does that make sense? We're not to venerate or exalt anybody. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. I love that we are siblings with Christ. Think about that. That Jesus is not only our Lord and Savior and High Priest and Redeemer, but he's our brother. And he loves us and he loves you. Jesus had at least four brothers and two sisters. What does the Catholic Church say? And I'm not trying to bag on the Catholic Church, but I am. (laughs) Some of their doctrines. uh, You can't venerate anybody. And they say that Mary was what? A perpetual virgin. That she never had another child. Okay, but he had at least four brothers and two sisters. Matthew 13, 55, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And the sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So at least in three or four occasions, Uh, Christ's brothers and sisters are mentioned. Jesus is saying our spiritual family is eternal and thus more important, get this, than our physical family. You know, it's interesting that everywhere I have traveled, when I meet born-again Christians, 
Don't know them, but immediately you feel a connection. Have you ever experienced that? It's like, oh, man, you love Jesus? Oh, yeah. And you have all this commonality, and you feel that spiritual connection because truly we're part of the family of God. I love that. <sighs> Matthew 10, 35 says, For I came to set man against father and daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's some pretty heavy stuff. But the idea is we can have nothing that comes between us and our relationship with God. That is first priority. It has to be. And when we do that, everything else works out. Jesus gave no special regard to his earthly family. He introduces the profound new covenant truth that those who hear the word of the Lord and obey it will become children of God and brothers and sisters of Christ. Man, who's your brother? Jesus Christ. <laughs> he created all things through him. We are family. First Timothy 5.1. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father and younger men as brothers. The older women as mothers and the younger women as sisters in all purity. You know, in the church, when I really grasped this concept, it became profound to me. It's like when I say, hi, sister, how you doing? I really mean it. Spiritually, you're my sister. Hey, brother, what's happening? I really feel connected and part of the family. In fact, oftentimes, spiritual families are stronger bonded than physical, natural, biological families. This profound truth that we must grasp, Jesus is saying the family of God, the church, is more important than our natural family. Matthew 12, 50, For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother, my sister, and my mother. So why do Catholics venerate Mary? Do you know many Catholics, and I see them every day as a hospice chaplain, they don't pray to God the Father, they don't pray to Jesus, ever. They pray to every saint you can imagine, but mostly they pray to Mary. Folks, that is simple heresy and idolatry. Pope Francis, uh, two years ago, said this. Mary has been present during the pandemic. Do you think she's omnipresent? Because they are giving Mary the attributes that only God has. Mary's been present during the pandemic. She's been close to people who sadly ended their earthly journey in isolation without the comfort and closeness of their loved ones. Mary is always there, and her maternal tenderness, prayers addressed to her are never in vain. Folks, if you, if you really nail a priest down, he will say, well, we don't pray to Mary, we just talk to her. Okay, that's how you justify heresy. <laughs> because the Pope said you pray to her. And everybody believes it. The, uh, the teachings on Mary are this. Number one, she herself was born a virgin. No corruption or inherited sin, she was sinless. Who's the only person that's been sinless? The Bible's clear. Jesus Christ. Number two, she never had any other children, but remained a pure, holy virgin for eternity. Okay, that's false. <laughs> Three, the assumption. The dogma of the assumption is intricately related to Mary's special privilege of being completely without sin, her immaculate conception. That's what they call it. And she didn't die. She was caught up. She never died. 
Mary, at the end of her early, earthly life, being completely free from sin as she was, did not see the decay of her earthly body, which is fitting for the mother of God. Okay, I, 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 I want to camp on that phrase a second. In the Bible, almost every time, God is a reference to God the Father. Are you with me? Jesus is referred to as Lord, as the Son of Man, as the Son of God, but rarely called God, even though he is one with the Father and part of the Godhead, there are still three persons in voluntary submission or subordination to each other. Does that make sense? So we have God the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, who is fully submitted to the Father and the Holy Spirit that does the work of both the Father and the Son and is omnipresent everywhere. To, to call Mary the mother of God, that, that phrase itself is misleading, if not heretical, okay? To say Mary is the mother of the Son of God is a true statement. But that statement infers she is the mother of even God the Father. By virtue of her immaculate conception, she had a supernatural conception, virgin birth, God shows that his mother, okay, God there is a reference to God the Father. His mother would be taken up body and soul into heaven to reign as queen. And they also call her what? The queen of heaven. So they see God the Father on his throne with Mary seated next to him as queen. And then Jesus, their son, somewhere amidst the throne. <laughs> uh, that's not heaven. Mary is not reigning like queen in heaven right now. Number four, her divine motherhood. She then becomes the mother just as God is the father of all who are in good standing with the Catholic church. Okay, the Bible never says that. Okay, as our divine mother, she hears our prayers and is present with all of us. And they end the statement with that. And that's where I got it. That's catholic.link.org, uh, the four Marian dogmas explained. Okay. So Mary is not omnipresent. She does not have the characteristics of God. No one does. She was not sinless. She wasn't born a virgin. <laughs> she can't hear your prayers. Only God can. In fact, praying to the dead is necromancy and is an abomination to God. Deuteronomy 18.10, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, or literally you could say who talks to the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. It breaks my heart that so many Catholics are so deceived and they pray more to saints and Mary than they do to God. And they venerate them. They say Mary and the saints are mediators between faithful Catholics and God. But God says in 1 Timothy 2.5, but there is one God and one mediator also between God, God the Father, and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He is the only mediator. In fact, there is only one priest right now that is operating in a priestly, uh, um, priestly way, <laughs> and that's Jesus. He's our high priest interceding for us, representing God the Father to us and us to God the Father. We are all priests over our own body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, but there's only one priest functioning as a priest, and that's Jesus. So even the audacity for someone to call themselves a priest is unbiblical. Jesus taught us how to pray, our Father who art in heaven. And, we, and then he said, anything you ask in my name shall be done. All right. 
So we're commanded not to pray to angels or dead humans throughout Scripture. Back to our text, Luke eleven twenty nine, and the crowds were increasing and began to say, "This gener oh, and Jesus began to say, "This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign." And Matthew will tell us later why Jesus said that, and yet no sign will be given it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Luke eleven thirty one, the queen of the south will rise up with men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So Matthew clarifies a few things. Matthew twelve thirty eight says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, what has Jesus been doing so far in the Gospel of Luke in his life? He's brought people back from the dead. He's healed probably thousands of people by this time. He just cast a demon out of a guy, and the Pharisees saw that. And what did they say at the beginning of Luke chapter 11 later on? They said, you did this by Satan's power. And he said, listen, you can blaspheme me, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, it won't be forgiven you in this age or the age to come. And so he's doing all these miracles He's, and they just observed miracles, even raising people from the dead. And now they say, show us a sign. <laughs> it's kind of like, have you not seen what I've been doing? <laughs> but he answered, hey, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. And yet no sign will be given it but the sign of Jonah. And Matthew will clarify what that means. Luke didn't. Matthew 12, verse 40. And just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Let's go back to Catholicism again. For some reason, they thought Jesus lied when he said that. Because the Catholics started what's called the celebration of Good Friday. Consider it for a minute. Three days and three nights. If Jesus died on the Catholic Good Friday, how long was he in the earth? Friday night, Saturday night, and he rose Sunday morning. That's only two nights. That belief makes Jesus a false prophet. Now, for those of you that love Good Friday, <laughs> you need to correct the people that are accusing Jesus of being a false prophet. And I know this is hard. This is, are you kidding me, Brett? You're, you're attacking Good Friday? Well, let's see, three nights or two nights? Jesus said three nights. I think I'll go with what Jesus said. And I'll stand for that. When was Jesus crucified? Most people say it was Good Friday. That simply is not possible. The Catholic Church started observing Friday as the day of Jesus' crucifixion, not until the fourth century. And it wasn't officially recognized as Good Friday until 692 A.D., Prior to that, not one true Christian would celebrate the death of Jesus Christ. And why do we celebrate it? Every time we take communion, what does it say? Whenever you eat the bread and drink the wine, you declare my death until I come. So not one born-again, solid Christian ever celebrated Good Friday 
until the 4th century, and the Catholic Church didn't officially recognize it until 692 A.D. Not one. Matthew 12.40, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we can figure out when Jesus was crucified. Uh, and usually I preach this around Palm Sunday, but Easter is coming up pretty quick. We're in the middle of Lent right now. Uh, so I thought I would do it today since uh, <laughs> we're in this text. So John eighteen twenty eight. And they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled and might eat the Passover. All right, meaning the Passover was going to be when? That night. Okay, Jesus and the disciples ate the Passover a day early the day before the actual Passover, John 19, 14. And it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. The day of the preparation is the day before Passover because Passover is, guess what, a Sabbath day. It's a high Sabbath day. Uh, verse 15, so they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answers, we have no king but Caesar. Wow. Okay, so this tells us very clearly Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation. So he couldn't have eaten Passover on the Passover. He ate it the day before the Passover. So what day was Jesus crucified? On the day of preparation. According to John, Jesus was the Paschal Lamb and as such must be slain on the day of preparation prior to the Passover meal. The slaying of the lambs began at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the hour at which Jesus is said to have expired. Interesting. Matthew 12, 44, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so the Son of Man, three days, three nights. Matthew 27, 62 says, But on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate, and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days, I will rise again. Jesus even said, three, After three days, not two, <laughs> I'll rise again. And when evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. What Sabbath? Passover. That's where they get confused. Passover itself is a high Sabbath. So they're not talking about Saturday there. They're talking about Passover, the, the day of preparation. So there were two Sabbaths that week. On the 14th day of the first month, between the two evenings at twilight is the Passover to Yahweh. And on the 15th day of the month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to Yahweh. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread on the first day you shall have a holy convocation a sabbath and you shall not do any laborious work but for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to Yahweh on the seventh day is a holy convocation you shall not do any laborious work so in the text from John 19:31, we learn that the body of Jesus needed to be removed from the cross because the sabbath was about to begin that Sabbath was a high Sabbath day, actually Passover, not Saturday. Saturday. Okay. All right. So we read this in Luke, Luke 24, 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. The actual Greek here says this, on the first day from the Sabbaths, plural. What Sabbaths? Passover and the Saturday Sabbath. Meaning Sunday. Yeah. All right. So it comes from the Greek word sabbaton. All right. So, whoa, I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> I can't see it. 
What time is it? Whew, good, I've got time. All right, so Palm Sunday happened on Sunday. <laughs> Remember, uh, Israel, their day started when? Sunset. Yeah, sunset. So their day starts at sunset. It ends at sunset the next day. Right, so clearing of the temple was Monday. All of that discourse was Tuesday. Early Passover arrest in Gethsemane was Wednesday. When Jesus, Wednesday uh, evening, when Jesus was arrested, which turned into uh, the Sanhedrin trial with Pilate, and he was crucified Thursday at 9 a.m., darkness at 12 noon to 3 p.m., and buried before 6 p.m., before the Sabbath, the Passover, on Friday. So Friday was a high holy Sabbath. Saturday was another Sabbath, so that was two Sabbaths. And Sunday was the first day of their week. The high Sabbath on Friday, the regular Sabbath on Saturday, and resurrection Sunday morning. So what we have, Jesus' last meal was Wednesday night, and he was crucified on Thursday, the 14th of the Hebrew month of Nisan. The Passover meal itself was eaten Thursday night, at sundown, which was actually became what? Friday. As the 15th of Nisan began. So there's how the events kind of look. And so Jesus was indeed in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. Any thoughts on that? Okay. So Jesus gave them the sign of Jonah, and he rose after being in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And through our faith in Jesus, we're part of God's family. Don't you like that? <laughs> I love it. So as believers, we are embraced by the profound truth that we are not merely acquaintances of Jesus. We're family. We're brothers and sisters. And we're members of God's family. In the book of Hebrews, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 11, it's written, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For this reason, he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. I want you to consider the humility in Christ. He eternally existed as God the Son, second member of the Trinity. Eternally, from eternity past, he wrote our DNA code. He created all things, and yet he humbled himself, became a suffering servant, took our sin on the cross, was crucified, died, was buried, spent three days in the midst of the earth, resurrected Sunday morning, and he calls us for eternity now brothers and sisters. Wow, that is amazing. The verse encapsulates the intimate bond we share with Christ who graciously extends his kinship to us. Worship team, come on up. So through his redemptive work, we are adopted into God's family. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. What's the rest of it? <laughs> I'm brain fading. Do you know that? <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Galatians 3.26 says, It is reaffirmed, for you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. As siblings of Christ, we are called to love one another fervently. To meet the needs of each other. To use our gifts to minister to the bride of Christ, the church, all of us together. The familiar connection brings not only profound joy, but also profound responsibility to honor and uplift one another as cherished members of God's household. Amen. Why don't we stand? Oh, Father God, we are so grateful that uh, you truly are our dad. You're our Abba Father, our Daddy, and God, that you love us as children. Lord, I pray that that profound expression of love we would be able to experience 
So for those watching online or for those here that, that aren't really feeling loved by you right now, God, I pray that you would envelop them with your love. You would hold them in your mighty arms. God, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and they would feel and experience that fatherly love that you have for all of us, your precious children. And Lord, let everybody know that they are precious in your sight. They're the apple of your eye. Somehow you are God and you know everything about us, even the number of hairs on our head. And you love us. You love us like a dad loves his kids. So God, let that love just permeate us. Let us realize how loved we are by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's sing this song to the Lord. Amen. I love that so much. You are so loved. You know, it says, a, a verse that's really known is Romans 8, 28, for, for we know that all things work together. But I like the verse, I love that verse, but I like the one that's two verses above. When we don't know how to pray, sometimes we don't, right? There's things going on in our life, and we don't know really how to pray. But Romans 8, 26 says, when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit of God prays for us. Did you know that? In this song right here, it says, um, Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water. Sometimes when I pray, all I can say is this one word, Jesus. His name brings so much power to our situation. So let's sing and praise him this morning as we go out, the Revelation song. Thank you so much. Uh, can we give him a hand one more time? Yeah. 
<laughs> we know, Jan. What a, what a great gift. God bless you. And next week, we're going to have live worship again with our worship team. Yeah, thank you, John. Yay. So we're excited. So uh, God bless you. I pray you have a blessed week. And uh, don't forget, we don't celebrate Good Friday. So, uh, and I always correct all the pastors. It's like, wow, you think Jesus is a false prophet? What's wrong with you? And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Just read the Bible. Oh, I know, it's kind of weird. I'm sorry, but that's it. Okay, God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you Wednesday night, 6.30 for Revelation. If not, next week, and I think we're doing potluck. Yeah, so I'll email out exactly what the, I think it's potatoes. Loaded potatoes. So could we make french fries? And put stuff on that. <laughs> God bless you. Have a great week.